So this, uh, this next section takes us even further into the story. Sarah Bender is an investigative reporter for the New York Times and soon finds herself at the center of the Shroud investigation. The protests continued. Meanwhile, for nearly a week, both the NIH and the Vatican were the scenes of in-house battles over how to proceed. Finally, they each issued press releases, reiterating that the Vatican was now in full possession of all materials related to the Shroud of Turin, intimating that any cause for controversy was now passed. But both camps left the question of actual genetic analysis or manipulation glaringly unaddressed. Sarah Bender watched the evening news over dinner as they profiled an odd new group calling itself Neoteric. The Neoterics had mobilized a candlelight vigil numbering in the thousands. The group's followers wore hooded iridescent robes of a holographic mylar material, giving them a monk-like aura, but with a futuristic patina. <coughs> Gathered in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park, they held bioluminescent candlesticks, chanting in Gregorian tones. The light from their wands rose into the night, casting the assembled faces in an unearthly glow. Rather than protesting what had allegedly occurred at the NIH, the Neoterics saw recent events as welcome harbingers of a new era. They disagreed, a spokesperson said, not with the basic precepts and beliefs of the world's religions, but with the modern day implementation of those belief systems. While there seemed to be no central organization or hierarchy of leadership in Neoteric, they did provide a brief charter statement. In a nutshell, the group painted most traditional religious institutions as having strayed far from the basic teachings of their spiritual founders. Neoteric, by contrast, favored the open source paradigm of the software world. In their statement, they advocated a quote, non-acquisitive, inclusive, and decentralized spirituality without rigid authoritarian hierarchies or controlling and moralistic dogma. As the TV camera panned across the assembled throng, Bender saw a montage of signs held aloft. One depicted a homeless person who looked like conventional images of Jesus being ordered away from the steps of a megachurch by a coiffed and tailored televangelist. Another pictured a priest, a rabbi, and an imam feasting together in the back of a convertible super stretch limo. But the best one, she thought, read Neoteric, the human race version 2.0, and Neoteric equals transcendence plus compassion. What more do we need? The assemblage seemed to be a loose confederation of cyber 20 somethings and new age enthusiasts. The obvious intent of the network television coverage was to present the, band as, the group as a band of kooks. But Sarah saw it differently. Having flirted with the speed metal and trance music scenes during her teens, she often found herself in sympathy with the primal energy of such movements. Thank goodness for the young and the young at heart, she thought, without a youthful sense of righteous indignation, coupled with a healthy dose of naivete, who would ever lead the char charge for any real change? The news story finally ended, and she gazed out the window at the winter landscape below. A dead leaf fell from a tree and landed on the windowsill outside her living room. Desiccated and brown, it was soon dusted in a delicate layer of new snow. She sat watching as more snow slowly enveloped the leaf in a soft white cocoon. Rocking from side to side in a DC metro car, he watched as a drowsy child sipped from a juice box offered by his mother. Strickland thought back to his first encounter with a straw. Not knowing quite what to do, he had blown Coca-Cola all over his mother's new summer dress. As a boy, he had marveled at how things appeared to operate in a certain way, and yet, with more information, a given perception could be turned completely on its head. For instance, when you sucked on a straw, it seemed as if you were drawing the liquid into your mouth. But in reality, you were creating a vacuum, and the atmosphere, like a giant unseen hand, was pushing down on the liquid, forcing it up into the straw. When he was 13, while playing in the backyard, 
Strickland experienced a simple but earth-shaking epiphany. His father had recently bought him a beginner's guide to stargazing, and he began reading about the planets and constellations. Numerous fires were raging in the wooded foothills near their home that summer after several seasons of drought. Strickland stood with his arms outstretched as tiny flakes of ash drifted down like snow from the orange-brown sky. It felt like the end of the world. He stared directly up at the midday sun, which had been reduced to a glowing red ball. And suddenly, he knew in his gut that it was a star, like any other, but simply closer. Before that moment, he had, of course, known it on an intellectual level, but now he felt it at his core. And the feeling persisted long after that summer's fires had died out. Afterward, it was like a reassuring secret. In the middle of the day, with the sun overhead, Strickland felt bathed in warming starlight. His stargazing book also detailed the history of celestial theory. In the pre-Copernican world, when it was still believed that the Earth was the center of the universe, theories abounded as to the mechanics of celestial orbits. Some proposed elaborate concentric crystal spheres containing the stars. But to explain the movements of observable objects in the heavens, such theories grew ever more unwieldy. A small number of celestial bodies, later shown to be planets, seemed inexplicably to reverse direction at regular intervals. As a result, layer upon layer of celestial spheres were added to the theory, like an ever-growing cosmic onion. Finally, Nicholas Copernicus, an astronomer and Catholic cleric, proposed that the prevailing view of the heavens was incorrect. If the Earth was simply shifted from its position as the center of the heavens to become just another of many planets orbiting the sun, all the observable phenomena of the night sky suddenly fell into perfect order, and the theory of celestial spheres came crashing down. But this profound shift of thought took hundreds of years to become universally accepted and threatened the very lives of its proponents. The reality of our celestial existence, the Earth turning on its own axis while simultaneously orbiting the Sun, required a leap beyond conventional logic. In the backyard that summer, with ashes drifting down around him, young Robert Strickland considered the notion that everything might not be as it seemed. There was little reason to believe that today's understanding of the universe was any more final than the theory of celestial spheres had been. What if our current scientific theories were also incomplete, perhaps in profound ways? And what if there were forces and principles beyond current understanding or testing? What if both viewpoints, what science told you and your deepest intuition, were correct in their own way? Maybe, at least in some instances, each was simply a different way of looking at the same basic truth. So that's that's it for the reading. Uh, any uh, questions or uh, comments or?